Good evening. Welcome to the Libertas lecture on the use of rap lyrics in criminal trials. Most of you will know me. I'm Felicity Gary, Queen's Counsel at Libertas Chambers. A little anecdote before we start. Over 30 years ago, when I was being interviewed for a place at Cambridge University that I didn't get, I was discussing the topic of rap lyrics in criminal trials. And I really took the view that it had nothing to do with evidence um, and it was much more about cultural expression. And I'm pretty shocked that 30 years on that um, we've nosedived into this chronic problem in the criminal justice system, that the research of uh, Dr. Awusu Bempa is uh, presenting this evening. Abinar is so excellent on this that I really want you to get to grips with the, the work that she's done. And just think about how timely tonight is. We've had an announcement by the Crown Prosecution Service in the, in the UK that they're going to revise their guidance on the use of, uh, I think they call it drill music, but we'll call it rap lyrics in criminal trials. And hopefully that will be a move for the positive. And we've also got a Senate bill in the United States uh, being led by some senior people in the music profession uh, to exclude uh, artistic expression in the use of evidence in criminal trials. So I'm delighted to introduce Abenar, Dr. Abenar Awisi Bempa. I'm hoping in the usual way you can share your slides. And while you're doing that, I'll just explain. The format is about 30 minutes of our expert lecture, then about 15 minutes of me giving some practice notes and some case examples of mine, as barristers do. And then we'll have a Q&A. So do uh, get your questions ready for the Q&A session. Thank you. Abenar, ready to go? Yep, just looking to unmute myself. Um, so thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to come and talk about my work on the admissibility and use of uh, rap lyrics as evidence in criminal trials. So I'm a scholar of uh, criminal law and evidence at the LSE. I'm also a, a probably lifelong consumer of rap music. So when I found out several years ago now that lyrics and videos were being um, treated as evidence of criminal behaviour, this immediately sparked my interest and was of concern to me. I, I wanted to know um, how this genre of music that is enjoyed by millions of people across the globe is being or finding its way into the courtroom and what implications this has. Um, before I say more about my, res my research though, I'll give a tiny bit of background and context in relation to uh, rap music as a genre. So I'm sure everyone knows that it is a genre of music, uh, but for those who aren't overly familiar, it's a form of really a black expressive youth culture. It originated in the Bronx, New York in the 1970s, the musical component of hip hop and was largely a response to social conditions at the time. Um, over the years, it's across the US and then across the globe. Uh, many subgenres of rap have emerged from party rap to conscious rap to gangster rap. Uh, in the UK, we've had a number of homegrown subgenres of rap from grime to road rap. And the most popular subgenre of rap here at the moment is drill. So drill originated in Chicago. It became popular here in the 2010s. It took on its own sort of um, unique UK or even London style, um, starting with popularity in London. It evolves really from the earlier gangster rap subgenre of rap, and it is characterized by violent content. So references to criminal behavior, to stabbings, to shootings, drug dealing, thing like, things like that. That is the norm within drill. Uh, despite this though, it is hugely popular. It has become mainstream. We've had number one drill albums and singles in the official charts in the past couple of years. And it is enjoyed by young people and some older people um, of all walks of life across the country. Also, despite the uh, violent or criminal nature of, of the content of some rap music, participation in rap can be hugely beneficial. Um, including for drill rappers. So many are, are, are not actually engaged in any criminal behavior whatsoever, or maybe grossly exaggerating uh, any involvement. Rather, rap can be a route to financial security and independence. And this in itself drives a lot of the content within rap music. So at the moment, violence sells and the appearance of authenticity um, sells. Beyond this though, creating and performing rap, including drill can be cathartic. 
It can provide a means of working through difficult experiences and emotions. Um, it can help to identif uh, facilitate identity development, to build self-esteem, to generate a sense of belonging, and also to develop linguistic skills. So um, you need to be quite highly skilled in that regard to get anywhere with rap music. Yet rap has long been associated with crime. And this forms a, a part of a legacy of criminalization of black arts and culture. So when it comes to rap, we've had prominent politicians publicly declaring that it encourages crime and violence. We see this also in newspaper headlines. Drill has been a particular target of the media and of the authorities. Opinion has been divided as to whether drill causes crime or whether it is a response to um, violent crime. There is no empirical evidence to substantiate claims that drill as a genre causes crime. We may be able to find some links between particular songs and videos and things that may have happened, but the, the implications of those links are very difficult to unpack. And as I said, there's no empirical evidence that drill is actually encouraging or, or causing people to commit crime. Yet the criminal justice response has been very heavy handed. So we've had drill videos being removed from YouTube. We've had um, gang injunctions being imposed, which prevent rappers from rapping about certain things or appearing in certain videos. And we've had courts imposing criminal behavior orders, most famously against Digga D, who was subject of a BBC documentary it was last year. Um, he, for example, has to have his lyrics vetted by the police before he releases any new music. And we've got what I'm focusing on today, which is the use of drill lyrics and videos as evidence of criminal behavior and criminality. Um, but as Felicity mentioned, it's not just drill, it's rap more generally, with drill being a, a subgenre of rap. But the most recent cases that, uh, on this have tended to involve drill music. So I have been looking, in terms of my research, I've been looking primarily at reported appeal cases in which music lyrics and videos were used as evidence of, uh, at a criminal trial or taken into account as an aggravating factor at sentencing. And through an analysis of these cases, I think we get a pretty good idea of what we might call the profile of rap cases and the way in which the law of evidence is being applied in relation to rap music. Um, there are some important limitations with focusing on appeal judgments, so I'll just note a couple of those. They don't tell us what's happening day in and day out in first instance trials, how often prosecutors are seeking to rely on rap music or whether judges are more likely to um, admit or exclude the evidence. Um, also, appeal judgments tend to lack detail about the exact nature or full extent of lyrics and videos. Um, in many cases, this could be because the admission or use of the evidence wasn't actually being challenged on appeal. So it's in a minority of the cases where this formed a, a ground for appeal. But even where it wasn't being challenged, we still get an idea of the kind of cases where rap is being used as evidence and what it's being used in relation to. And where it is being challenged, we expect to see the highest level of scrutiny of the issues uh, in the Court of Appeal. So an analysis of these cases does tell us quite a lot about the handling of rap music as evidence in criminal trials. And what I have found seems to be broadly consistent with the anecdotal evidence that I've heard so far, and also my, uh, my own experience in some of these trials. But I would be interested in hearing in, in the Q&A if this reflects um, your experience and practice of those who practice criminal law. So uh, through searching legal databases, I have so far found almost 40 cases, which I think are relevant to this topic. And about 30 of them, rap music lyrics or videos have been used as evidence uh, against a defendant at a trial or treated as an aggravating factor at sentencing. These cases date back as far as 2005, but most are from um, the last few years. And there are some very clear patterns that emerge from the case law. So in particular, rap is often treated as bad character evidence. It is used almost exclusively as evidence against young black boys and men, uh, usually teenagers, in London and some other urban areas. It is used often in cases involving very serious offending, um, including weapons, lots of firearms offenses, and violence, including homicide offenses. And often these are cases of joint enterprise or secondary liability, where we might see the material being used to link defendants to each other or to the crime, and often or at the same time as um, evidence of gang involvement to put offenses into a gang's context. 
And rap is being used in ways which we are not seeing other genres of music or forms of creative expression being used. That's not to say that there are no cases involving lyrics from other genres, but I've seen very, very few and nothing like the pattern and trends that we're seeing in relation to rap. So that in itself raises some questions and some concerns. Um, I'm going to highlight some of those concerns. I might not go into a lot of detail for time's sake. I will then talk a bit about how the relevance of rap and its prejudicial effect seems to be assessed in the case law. And then I'll say something about where we might be going or where we should be going from here. So the first concern that I have is the categorization of rap as bad character evidence. Um, for those who are lawyers, they will know that bad character evidence is defined in the Criminal Justice Act of 2003 as evidence of or of a disposition towards misconduct. And misconduct is defined as the commission of an offence or reprehensible behaviour. Now, the case law doesn't always or even usually make it clear which aspect of this definition is being applied to rap. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be a suggestion that the lyrics or videos in themselves are a criminal offence. So it would seem that this is being treated as reprehensible behaviour or um, alternatively as showing disp disposition towards misconduct. But it begs the question of what is reprehensible about writing or performing violent or provocative uh, rap lyrics or videos? And if that is reprehensible, is it not also the same to... To, to write violent lyrics for other genres of music, or to perform in violent plays, or to write violent novels, or to play violent video games? Why is rap being conflated with character in ways which other forms of creative expression and violent pastimes generally are not? Now, on the face of it, the most obvious answer to that is that rap is a form of uh, Black expressive youth culture, and it is performed primarily by people who fit a pre-existing image or stereotype of um, what a criminal looks like or behaves like. And so the artistic value can become devalued in much the same way as we've seen with um, Black culture and forms of art throughout history. It has, though, been suggested to me that this is a benefit to defendants, um, and I would, again, be interested in getting some feedback on, on that from anyone who has experience with these cases in practice. So the argument is that as bad character evidence, it has to not only be relevant to be admissible, but it has to come through one of seven gateways, which are set out in Section 101 of the Criminal Justice Act of 2003. So there is essentially an additional barrier or hurdle for the prosecution to pass for it to get in if it is labeled as bad character evidence. Now, from what I've seen, Rap is most commonly being adduced through Gateway D of Section 101 of the 2003 Act as being relevant to an important matter and issue between the defendant and the prosecution. And I'll say more about the issues to which it's said to be relevant in a moment, but this is often going to motive or state of mind or propensity. So if it is said to be relevant, it is likely said to go to an important matter and issue and therefore pass Gateway D. So the real question is the preliminary question of relevance. The gateways in themselves don't seem to do much to prevent rap from being admitted. Um, so I think that it remains largely uh, inappropriate and perhaps unnecessary to label it as character evidence. But again, I welcome feedback on, on that whether anyone has experience of the 2003 Act in itself preventing rap music from getting into court. Another issue which deserves scrutiny is the relationship between rap, race and gangs, including the potential for rap to be used to amplify stereotypes about black youth culture and black men and boys as gang members and as criminals. Um, this is possible partly because of themes within rap music, so especially drill exploits some of these stereotypes for popularity and for gain. But more importantly and significantly, rap can be used to amplify negative stereotypes because those stereotypes exist within our society. We see it in media representation of black men and boys in particular. We see it also being reinforced and reproduced throughout the criminal justice system with the overrepresentation of black people as suspects, as prisoners. So prosecutors can at least potentially use rap to help build a case in which black boys and men fit into this sort of racialized figure of the criminal without having to say that expressly. They look like a criminal, they sound like a criminal, they're rapping about being a criminal, they, they must be a criminal. And these stereotypes of um, black criminality are reinforced through a gang narrative, which we see in many of these cases. So the term gang is disproportionately applied to black people in a way that does not correlate to the commission of uh, serious youth violence. So for example, 
the Metropolitan Police's gangs matrix, about 80% of individuals named on that are black young men and boys, whereas the data suggests that black youth are responsible for about 27% of serious youth violence. And the majority of those named on the matrix are labeled as being at very low level risk of offending. Um, but what's happening is that the term is being disproportionately applied to black people such that the term gang itself comes to evoke images of black male criminality. And rap seems to be one way in which those images can also be evoked by um, linking defendants to gangs through their lyrics or through participation in supposedly gang themed music videos. And in cases which are said to be gang related, it's often police officers who are called to act as experts. Um, they're often called as, as gang experts, but in that capacity can be asked to interpret and contextualize these rap lyrics and videos. And so that's another sort of related but separate issue of concern. So questions need to be asked about the qualification of police officers as rap experts, because being an expert on gangs does not in itself make someone an expert on rap, just as being an expert on rap does not make one an expert on gangs. Um, there are also questions to be asked about partiality here. So ju the organization Justice, they did a report on racial injustice in the youth justice system last year. And they put it quite bluntly in saying that in the context of explaining drill music, the use of police officers as experts amounts to no more than the prosecution calling itself to give evidence. They have little understanding of the culture within which drill is created and how it's made. Now, sometimes we do see linguists being used um, for, by prosecutors to interpret rap lyrics. And actually, from what I've seen in, in more recent cases, whether it be a linguist or a police officer, the interpretation of lyrics isn't necessarily bad. It might be really quite accurate. But what's missing is the context. So there is no denying that drill lyrics in particular portray violence. There's a lot of talk of harming people, of making money in illegal ways. This is usually done in the first person with rappers striving to appear authentic. The question is, why are they doing this? Is it relevant and reliable evidence of criminality and criminal behavior? So that brings us to the question of how the relevance of rap is being assessed in these cases. So as I'm sure many will know, to be admissible, any item of evidence has to be relevant, meaning that it has to increase or decrease the probability of a, a contested fact or a matter in issue. And as I've mentioned, rap was often introduced through Gateway D of Section 101 of the Criminal Justice Act of 2003 as being relevant to an important matter and issue between the prosecution and the defense. Although, sort of as a side note, in some cases, um, it wasn't introduced through Section 101, but rather through Section 98 of that Act as evidence being to do with the alleged facts um, of the offence. But either way, there were four slash five key issues to which rap was said to be relevant in the case law. And I'll just outline these and mention a couple of cases. Again, I'm not going to go into great detail for time's sake. But the first issue is motive. Uh, so here we can use the case of Sode as an example. In this case, the defendant had appeared in a music video two years before a joint enterprise murder. And that video was adduced as evidence of his gang affiliation and in turn as evidence of motive for the crime because it was said to be a, a gang rival attack. Um, within the video, he was said to make gestures and remarks which were consistent for a support for a gang. Keeping in mind, I just like to emphasize that this was a two-year-old video um, created when he was 14 years old. The second issue is state of mind, including intention. So in the case of O, for example, a six-month-old video that was found on YouTube was used to help uh, prove possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life. According to the judgment, the appealant in the video was rapping with many others and using words which were said to relate to guns and gangs. Um, there were some extracts of the lyrics in the judgment and it's noted in the judgment that there were no specific threats to anyone in the lyrics. It was quite general lyrics about guns and gangs in the local area. So that was adduced through Gateway D as going to a disposition or propensity as a gang member to use gun violence for the purposes of endangering life and as being relevant to the important matter and issue of whether the gun was in his possession with intent to endanger life. The third and fourth issues I think are, are linked to many of the cases. Um, appearance in music videos in particular has been used to counter defenses of innocent presence at the scene of a crime and innocent association with co-defendants as in the case of Lewis. And the fifth issue is propensity. So for example, using lyrics or videos to show a propensity for violence or familiarity 
with firearms, which can then go to prove one of these other issues like motive or mm, intention. It would be a bit of a rush to go to my. Just going to interrupt uh, and ask everybody just to mute themselves. Thank you. Somebody we can hear talking. Thank I did, you, I didn't know if I was losing my connection or something. No, no, I think someone's forgotten <laughs> yeah. to mute themselves. So keep going and uh, right. hope okay. you'll be okay. Thank you. <laughs> so those are the issues to which uh, rap lyrics or videos were most often said to be relevant. Now, from what I can see, though, this the relevance in relation to these issues or any other issue is not being properly scrutinized in these cases. So my position is that rap is rarely relevant evidence of criminal disposition or behavior. And this is because rap cannot be taken at face value. It is a highly complex genre of music. Um, it does rely on hyperbole, on symbolism, on figurative language, on dark humor. With some genres like drill, references to acts of violence and weapons is to be expected, including references to things which may have actually happened, especially in the local community. And as I've said a couple of times now, rappers strive to and are expected to appear authentic. So we can't ordinarily infer that an individual thinks or behaves in a certain way based on their lyrics and music videos. Nor is there evidence of a comparative propensity. So there's no evidence that rappers are more likely to commit crime than those who don't rap or that people who rap about stabbing and shooting are more likely to stab and shoot people than people who don't. That's you. Yeah. Now, yeah. to be clear, I think we can hear. Yeah, I just to ask everyone to please mute themselves. I think we've just yeah, had some people. Do you want it unmuted now? All oh, right, so it's okay now, yeah? No, if you could mute yourself, please, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, I've lost where I was there. So, to be clear, I'm not saying that rap is never relevant evidence of a crime, um, but I think that something more than commonplace lyrics about guns or gangs or the kind of crime which the defendant is accused of is required. Arguably to be considered relevant there needs to be a strong and direct connection between lyrics and videos and the crime which the defendant is actually accused of. Yet in the cases that I've looked at um, rarely could it be said that there is such a direct connection. I, uh, my estimate is that in about eight of these cases it could plausibly be argued that lyrics or videos were connected to the crime charged. Um, although it doesn't seem that that argument was actually made in, in eight of those cases. Rather, the material tends to be commonplace lyrics, which are used to show a disposition or an interest in uh, things like violence or familiarity with firearms and gangs. Even when it comes to establishing gang membership, the relevance of lyrics and videos is not as apparent as the case law suggests. So even if we assume that lyrics and videos have been interpreted correctly, references to gangs is common, especially uh, within drill. And non-gang affiliated young people participate in these videos for lots of reasons. It can be for fun, can be out of boredom, um, can be to gain popularity or attention. It can be as a nod to the local audience. Drill is hyper-local, so you would expect to hear references to postcodes in local areas. Also, identifying with a gang has been described by Amnesty International in, in their study of the gang's matrix as being porous, fluid, and often for show. And that makes it very difficult to infer current affiliation from past indicators of support for a particular gang. But even if that doesn't convince uh, you that the, the, it, the relevance is defeated, surely these factors have a substantial impact on the probative value of the evidence. And on that note, we don't see a lot of scrutiny of various factors around the creation or the performance of, of rap lyrics and videos, which would affect its probative value, um, even where one might be able to argue that it's relevant. And this is important because not all relevant evidence is admissible, particularly where its probative value is outweighed by its prejudicial effect. So if we think about the age of the material, for example, this doesn't seem to have been a, a huge consideration in the case law. Um, so in Sode, as I've mentioned, there was a two-year-old rap video created when the appealant had been 14 years old and the Court of Appeals simply stated that the age of the material did not reduce its impact or diminish its relevance with no explanation as to why that was the end of the sentence. Um, it's also not clear what level of participation is required by defendants in music videos before its contents can be attributed to their character or behaviour. In the one successful challenge that I've come across to the use of rap evidence, the case of Alimi, 
The appealant's mere presence as an extra in two music videos was held not to be enough to associate him with a gang, as it had been at his trial. But then in the case of Lewis, for one of the appealants, it seems that getting a shout out in a music video and appearing in that music video and making gun gestures at the camera was enough to associate him with the contents of the video. So it's not clear where the line is drawn. Um, if it's, it's not given, been given a whole lot of scrutiny. So on the whole, I'm quite troubled by how readily the courts have been to, uh, or how willing the courts have been to take rap literally, to take it at face value and how little scrutiny is being given to ways in which the conventions of rap and factors around its creation, um, which can affect its, its relevance and probative value. And as I've said, even if evidence is relevant, it shouldn't be admitted if its probative value is outweighed by its prejudicial effect or where it would have such an adverse effect on the fairness of the proceedings that it ought not be admitted in the words of section 78 of PACE. The potential for prejudicial effect is pretty huge when it comes to um, rap music as evidence. Jurors may believe that violent or inflammatory lyrics are far stronger evidence of guilt than they actually are, perhaps because of a lack of understanding of, of rap uh, music and culture, perhaps because it plays into stereotypes. In fact, there have been several studies conducted in America which uh, show a bias against rap music rooted in racial stereotypes. So to reference one study, uh, Dunbar and Kubrin's study, which was published in 2018, they gave groups of participants identical lyrics. Some were told that it was rap music, some were told that it was country music, some were told that it was rock music. The participants were more likely to assume that the rapper is in a gang, has a criminal record, and is involved in criminal activity than artists from other music genres, and that was based merely on the genre of the lyrics, not the actual content of the lyrics. So these kind of studies show or how easily rap music uh, could be used as to reinforce biases and the risk of rap being taken too literally in the courtroom. Yet the appeal judgments tend to only go as far as acknowledging the potential for prejudicial effect, but taking the view that admission would not be unduly prejudicial. So in the case of Awayemi, for example, which I haven't referenced on the slide, but it's a 2016 Court of Appeal case, the lyrics at issue were said not to be unduly prejudicial because according to the court, they went far beyond hyperbole and a love of rap and indicated the extent to which the appealants had signed up to gang and gun culture. Now, the full transcript of the lyrics is not in the judgment, but there is excerpts and there wasn't anything that I saw in there to necessarily support that view. Um, but also the extent to which someone has signed up to gang, gun and gang culture, whatever we're taking that to mean, is precisely the kind of thing that you cannot easily deduce from rap lyrics and videos. And yet on the whole, juries are being trusted to put their emotions aside, to distinguish between fact and fiction and to attach proper weight to the evidence. They are given directions from the judge, but these are legal directions and where it's being used as bad character evidence, these will be typical bad character evidence explaining the uh, rel potential relevance of the evidence, what it's being used in relation to. Um, but the broader cultural context, the artistic conventions, the social influences within the genre are seldom mentioned in these judgments and don't seem to need to form any part of a direction to a jury. So in my view, on the whole, the case law reveals quite an uninformed and worrying approach to assessing the admissibility of rap, especially its relevance and its prejudicial effect. I think from what I'm hearing, there may have been some shift in some first instance cases, um, especially where the defense are being assisted by an expert to help push back against the admission of rap evidence. But it's clear that a much more consistently rigorous approach to this is needed. So at the very least, I think that relevance needs to be scrutinized from an appropriate and informed viewpoint. And I mean informed on the culture and conventions of rap music. Um, decisions on admissibility need, need to take into account a variety of factors which can affect its relevance and probative value, including who wrote any lyrics or created music videos, how connected are, there, are they between the actual, or any connections between the actual lyrics and videos and the offense at issue, um, the age of the material, the role which the defendant played in music videos, keeping in mind, for example, that young people do participate in gang-themed videos for a variety of reasons. 
whether the lyrics contain information which was not easily accessible to a defendant, and if the prosecution are seeking to rely on particular lyrics or extracts from a song, how does that fit into the song more broadly? Are they being cherry picked and taken out of context to fit a certain narrative? And even if lyrics are specific and connected enough to the offense to be relevant, exclusion might still be warranted on the basis of prejudicial effect. In fact, this might be one area of evidence law, like for example, sexual history evidence, where a, generally, a general exclusionary rule could be justified. So this is a controversial form of evidence. Decision-making can be informed by bias and stereotypes, and there are significant interests at stake in these cases. But formulating a specific test of admissibility or an exclusionary rule is not an easy task. I haven't attempted uh, it so far. Um, we need to find a way to set very sort of meaningful and appropriate and fair boundaries. As was mentioned, the Crown Prosecution Service is working on new guidance on the use of drill as evidence. So we wait and see what comes of that. But in the meantime, in the meantime there is this proposed bill in uh, New York, which has made its way into the, the headlines last week because it's receiving support from some very high profile rappers. So under this bill, evidence of a defendant's creative or artistic expression would be inadmissible unless the prosecution can prove with clear and convincing evidence that one, it is literal rather than figurative or fictional, two, that there is a strong factual nexus indicating that the creative expression refers to the facts of the crime alleged, Three, that it is relevant to a fact and issue. And four, that it has distinct probative value not provided for by other admissible evidence. Um, interestingly, so this applies to all forms of creative expression, not just rap, but the target is rap music because that is what we are seeing being treated as evidence. Uh, but really it's putting, it's starting from a presumption of inadmissibility and then creating quite a high hurdle for the prosecution to rebut that by proving that the evidence is relevant, that it is actually reliable, and I think key in this that it is actually necessary for the court to hear this evidence, especially given the potential for prejudicial effect. I think what's really important though is that any sort of criteria for admission that uh, may be developed doesn't simply become a tick box exercise which then gets used to justify the admissibility of rap evidence. What we need to be focusing on here is a way to keep out irrelevant, unreliable, and slash or highly prejudicial evidence. And I will stop there. Well, thank you, Abenar. And you didn't mention, and I will, the publication that's at the bottom of your last slide, um, if you did. Um, I think it's really important for those of you who are lawyers and have access to the Criminal Law Review. Um, what we've heard today is produced in a an excellent article that in the Criminal Law Review on the irrelevance of rap and goes does that deep dive into the cases in England and Wales, the particular appeal cases that we've heard something about today. Um, I'm now going to rattle on for a few minutes while you think of the questions that you want to ask our excellent experts. So hang on with us, Abenar. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you. But as always, in Just our little sorry to interrupt. Yeah, or well, you can leave it. I'm not going to use slides, so you're welcome to leave it. I'm sure everybody's very excited to see Jay-Z. Um, <laughs> But um, in the meantime, what I always try and do in these lectures is give us a few practice notes or stories from cases that I've been in or that I think might be useful for those of us who are practitioners. So apologies to those of you who are not. But for example, I have a current murder appeal where an old rap video was relied on to suggest gang involvement solely due to the time that that video was uploaded and that some similar bandanas were visible. So it had no link by content to the crime at all. And at the moment, the single judge has refused leave and we're re renewing our application for leave to appeal before the full court. And in that appeal, I've, I compared the approach to Tom Jones and Delilah, um, which might sound silly, but if you think about it, Tom Jones has been singing Delilah for decades. It's actually about a man who kills his unfaithful former partner who stabs her to death. And that's why Delilah is no more. Um, it's really quite a shocking song. 
And in the decades that he's been singing that, I'm pretty confident it has never been used as a piece of evidence um, against a defendant. So it's a good illustration of, of what we've heard today from our expert. So, but at the moment, those arguments have been rejected. Fortunately, the wonderful Abenar has published her article in the 2022 edition before we've been heard. So we've uh, relied on her publication in that application to renew. And I'm very hopeful that the full court will give greater consideration to the issues that she's written about. I've got another murder appeal where, a, or at least ongoing uh, appeal, uh, advice on appeal, where a rap video was used to suggest both um, gang affiliation and suggesting that that was relevant to the issues in the trial, even though that video was made as part of a community project. So it's shocking to think that the state would encourage that artistic expression and use the content and language in that video against young people in a criminal trial. So that's another example of where we really have taken that um, We've stopped, we're not thinking about the effect that this evidence seems to have. It, it appears to have taken that nosedive that I mentioned at the beginning of the session into totally unthinking approach to irrelevant, highly prejudicial evidence. Uh, and then I've had two recent trials where, to be fair, some evidence was excluded. But nonetheless, the prosecution then sought to rely on other related evidence. So uh, in one case, relying on a tag that they called a nickname that was actually uh, the young person's name that he used on his PlayStation. And the name was C-Bands, which when I looked it up on um, a lyrics website, there are literally hundreds of thousands of songs that have the word C-bands in. It's about an elastic band that goes around money. It's a completely common lyric. Um, and as far as I can tell, not just in rap music. And yet somehow this use of that label on a PlayStation 4 became admissible in a criminal trial because there'd been some mention of C-bands in a telephone call by another offender. So it was then used in, in effect for gang membership um, and association with this very tenuous connection because it was said to be a nickname that someone used all the time rather than a label uh, for uh, their use of a PlayStation. So in my view, it had nothing to do with the alleged killing. Fortunately, that client was acquitted uh, in one of those trials um, and in the other trial there wasn't that use of a tag the judge did exclude the music evidence altogether uh, but in the one where the the tag went in in the closing speech of the prosecution the prosecutor said these people are not normal and I then had to deliver a defense speech uh, to a jury that was very diverse in a city that was very diverse and say to them, look, you are more diverse than we are. How dare that be said? Uh, you may go home to a black husband or a mixed race child or someone who listens to rap music. You may well listen to it yourself. You know, those sorts of speech. I can't remember exactly what I said, but I found it appalling. And I think that really expresses uh, the problematic area in these cases. So we really have to watch what we think as professionals, what we say as professionals, how we approach evidence that we just don't understand, particularly if it's not part of our day-to-day -day music listening or uh, the genre of music that we choose to download on Spotify. Um, so for practice notes, if you like, I think it's really important to understand and educate yourself about things that you don't necessarily personally engage in. Some of you may do, some of you may not. But understand and educate yourself about these types of evidence that are being used in these, in my view, very unusual ways. I think always object. So much comes out of the discussions in relation to this material that I do think first instance judges are excluding these types of evidence slightly more often than they used to, maybe not as often as they should. And I think part of the problem is the idea that 
murder can be proved even if the killer can't be identified. So what that really means is we're prosecuting groups of people when they, we actually have no evidence of who is actually responsible. And we're not looking for meaningful connections. So I always try and submit there's a no, no case to answer. So we can really review what the actual evidence is against a person at the close of the prosecution case. And when we've got cases on limited evidence, such as patterns of phone calls and music, they're really so weak that in my view, the judiciary need to really consider whether they should let such cases go to the jury. Um, often the circumstantial evidence direction is wrongly form formulated. Three out of the uh, eight of the recent murder trials that I've done, the draft directions did not include the requirement that the evidence has to be capable of rebutting realistic possibilities. So go back and read Kilburn from the 70s. Uh, fortunately, uh, Lord Justice Fulford has mentioned it in a recent case of Bassett, um, which was a successful, what we might call joint enterprise appeal. Um, but make sure the direction, at least on circumstantial evidence is correct. And also, I think there is a, a, a bigger question around how we charge people in group violence or group homicide cases where we might have charged many of them with violent disorder. When someone dies, it does seem now that we're routinely charging that as a group killing when the threshold of assistance and encouragement is so low. And we're going to discuss some of those latter issues in another webinar with our associate member Beatrice Krebs in March on causation and empty nexus. Um, so I think those are some things that I would encourage everyone to think about, really object, um, understand what you're objecting to and why, and use the trial as an educative process because um, first instance trial judges are engaging and I'm rather hoping that the Court of Appeal will too and certainly we have these initial sounds from the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, so I hope those practice notes or stories are useful to you. Um, I'm going to look through the chat to see if we've got any questions. I haven't given the name of the cases because they're all going on. I'm just giving you some ideas. Uh, if if I when they're published, you'll know, and I'll tweet about them. But um, we've got a question in the chat from Patrick with the long history of hip hop and rap being associated to the delinquency and the penal law biases. Should we call for penal justice system reform? Abana, what do you think of that? And then if anyone else wants to ask a question, we've got so many of you. Can you put your little emoji hand up, and then I can work out. Uh, who to go to. Thank you. System reform. I mean, yes, but you know, not just because of this. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that I think that this this is revealing of a wider problem that we see in, in the criminal justice system. So um, two American scholars, Eric Nielsen and Andrea Dennis, who wrote a book on rap on trial from an American perspective, and they, they write in the book that this is sort of a window into and out of racial disproportionality in the criminal justice system. It both reveals that racial disproportionality and is also a um, cause of it. And so it's both a cause and a consequence. So yes, I think that this should be um, something that spurs us towards larger scale reform. I, mean, I don't know how much more detail you Well, I agree. <laughs> when you think we've got the Lamy report, we've got the work on joint enterprise by um, Becky and Patrick in relation to race. Mm. We've got the understanding now that these gang stereotypes are causing serious prejudice. We know that people are being charged with homicide instead of violent disorder and we haven't really analysed why. Um, we, uh, in spontaneous events anyway, um, we, we know that mute rap music is being used um, and we know now from the example I've given you that this is now extending out into labeling that kids use on computer games. So I, I definitely agree, systemic change has 
should I'm be loudly a, called for. The question is how we go about. How we do it, doing, yes. <laughs> because like I said, there's been a lot of talk about it. We all know about this, the, the broader racial disproportionality and biases, but how do we go about actually changing and fixing the system? Well, I think education is part of it. And that's what these sessions, our webinars are about. But also I make a little bit of a joke about, uh, and I said it to you earlier on before we were recording, that we talk a lot about imposter syndrome. And I've thought about that a lot. And women talk about imposter syndrome. We do feel like imposters sometimes. But I've decided to own that and think, well, I am an imposter. So I'm going to turn up and have these arguments that may not have been had before. And I think as lawyers, that's what we need to do. Is there a fresh argument that we can look at, that we can raise in where we are, whether as an academic or a practitioner, that opens up everybody else's mind to how this is not working? Um, I think we've got some defence solicitors in the group. Graham, it's a great question, and I know you've got some experience in this area. Can we hear you, or do I need to read out what you've put in the chat? Graham Wilkinson. Uh, I know, no, you can, you can hear me. You can hear me. Great. Go ahead, right. Graham. Go ahead, Graham. Uh, yeah, I just had sort of given the um, the lack of sort of cultural understanding within obviously the judiciary, um, and as far as the expert evidence um, is concerned, who would you suggest would be the relevant expert? expert to go to i guess um to, to give to i guess to give an explanation uh, 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 uh regarding the sort of cultural aspects of, of obviously draw and grime and, and that sort of music yeah um so yeah. there is now a sort of so small work, work, work of experts i can hear the feedback, hear the feedback. is it okay to oh sorry i'll, I'll mute i'll mute, yeah. I'll mute myself yeah. right <laughs> Thank you. It's very distracting. I can hear myself talking back. Oh, I can hear my own voice. Um, but yeah, there is now a small network of, of people working as experts in these cases and hopefully a growing network. And it's quite interdisciplinary. So academics who um, focus either on law or criminology, cultural studies who have a specialty in uh, things like hip hop culture and black cultural expression, but also youth workers industry insiders, you know, rappers themselves. There's a, there's, I don't think there's a shortage of who has expertise here. There's probably a question of who the corpse will accept as experts, uh, but the go-to yeah, at, that's, the, that's the, go yeah. the go at the moment seems to be academic scholars, um, some youth workers and uh, some industry insiders. So I'm, I'm not gonna name names because I don't want to <laughs> put, <laughs> put anyone's name out there. But if anyone is looking for expert witnesses, I can help refer people on. And I'm, I'm sure I'm sure I can too. So um, between us, we can help. Uh, I actually sometimes just have to make use of Mrs. Google, not just for the expert, for the things like the lyrics. If I ha and often you come into a case quite late. So if you're a defence solicitor and you're in early and you're in the police station and this is something that your client might be questioned about, it's really important to get a handle on the lyrics and what they're actually suggesting. You can have these conversations with the police really early on and that might inform the Crown Prosecution Service and they might then inform their prosecutors because we do have a privileged, largely white male set of silks that tend to prosecute the homicides in which this evidence is used. Obviously, it will be um, barristers and solicitors um, in other types of criminal cases, but certainly in the homicide cases that I get involved in, um, to have everybody early on seeking to understand this stuff and informing the sort of white male privileged bar that tend to prosecute, I'm not saying always, um, that if they can learn in the way that we ha are learning, then it, it makes for a hope that the trial itself will be more balanced and, if, and those applications may not be made at all, that actually decisions are made not to leave it to the judge but actually not to rely on that evidence. And that's why I'm rather hopeful for the CPS guidance. I think it's good that they're having a public conversation about it, that there's been publicity about that. Um, but in the meantime, our role is not just to represent, but to educate on this topic, because certainly those of you who are here today, A, have an interest and B, have now listened to Abenar. Um, so you know you know some of the thoughts and see you're all going to go away away and read the criminal law review so you can 
uh, take it and hand it in to the judge um, in whatever case you're in. Um, we've got Al. Al, can we hear from you? Or do you want me to read it out? I know that I could. Uh, no, I, I was interested. Great. Hi, Al. Hi. So I'm, I'm a solicitor at Burnberg Pierce, but um, I was interested because I know mainly through my children that Grimes a worldwide phenomenon. And actually, although it, it's, it's not, it, 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 for example, in Dublin, there's a sort of a white grime scene. I'm just wondering whether the courts there or elsewhere in the world take the same attitude um, in terms of admissibility or not. Yeah, it's a good question. So where we have the most information outside of the UK is from the US. Um, there's a, a longer history of this happening there and a bigger history of this happening. And interestingly, you know, the trends that I'm picking up from the case law are the same trends that we're seeing in the US. So the same kind of lyrics being used against the same kind of defendants in the same kind of way, the same kind of crimes, although their laws of evidence are different when it comes to bad character. Um, so certainly in the US, there's also been some research on this in Canada, which again, similar reflections. And then I'm aware of cases, I'm not aware of any real research being done on it. But I'm aware of cases of rap being used as evidence in France, in Holland, I think there was one in Germany. I'm not sure of any Irish cases, um, but yeah, it's not strictly a, a UK slash US um, issue. No, would would you say it follows the same racial biases as it does here? Well, where, where, where there is the information, yes. So in the US and Canada here, yes. I don't know enough information about the cases in other jurisdictions to know. I think that there, certain European countries are less diverse than the UK. So we might be seeing, if and when we're seeing it, we might see it used more against white defendants. Um, but yeah, so I can't answer that because I don't have the, the knowledge, but where we have a broad enough picture, we do see it being used. So, in particular ways following particular trends. Well, interestingly, in two of the cases that I've been in, some on one uh, video where there was some music playing in the background. So it wasn't a, a music video. It was a video of some knives that was admissible. Um, but in the background, some music was playing with some, let's call it pretty hefty ly lyrics. And the persons in the video and the particular defendant it was said to be relevant to was white. And the judge excluded the music in the background. The video was shown without sound. Now, whether that is an improvement in the approach of judges to music or it was a different approach because that particular defendant was white is a really interesting question, isn't it? But I can say that there's another example of where if you're robust about your challenges to this type of evidence, and it wasn't my client, but I objected to it as well because I didn't want that material before the court. And that was excluded, if you like. The video had to be played without sound. And the other one um, that it was excluded in that I told you about where the name was, the label name was still left in. Some of the music was excluded, but postcode signs were still used and a police officer gave evidence of those. But the music was excluded. And at that, on the day that we were having the legal argument, a drill song was number one in the UK. It was just fantastic. And I think actually, probably the judge was sufficiently informed, highly likely probably from personal uh, relationships. You know, as we talk about, we've got young people in our own families. I don't know, but I had to say to the judge, look, it's in writing, in my submissions, it's number one in the UK now. Um, so I don't know what's... Uh, I'll just add to that, it's a number, I know what song you're talking about. Um, <laughs> Dion Wayne and Russ Millies, but it's a number one video where we see postcode signs and we see green bandanas being waved. We see all of these, you know, tropes and conventional things that are happening in drill, which the police are saying, oh, this is evidence of them being in a gang. Yeah, and look, I found out most of that from my client. So the other practice note, and I think it's probably a good place to end is, if this music is being used against your client, you, you've got a fair bet that your client knows what it's about. 
And that's your best place to learn. You have to accept that you don't know. You have to look a bit foolish at times. You know, I'm afraid I turn out as middle-aged mum and not quite as cool as I think I am on most days. But I learned and I learned enough and I could look it up and I could find the lyrics and I could look up the number one and I could understand it. And then I could say, well, there's this, what does that mean? Or why is that here? So you have to have that extra conversation with your client. Um, and sometimes your client is the rapper and it's a terrible thing for the rapper to be prosecuted and used against them is the evidence of their, their musical expression. So it's really a hard conversation to have with your clients as well. But I think it's really important. The earlier we can do that, the better and the more we learn um, and the more we read about the expertise of um, Dr. Awusu Bemper, who's given us her excellent presentation tonight. I can see the comment by Alan in the chat. Thank you, Alan. And um, I'm so grateful that, that so many of you turned up. I think at its height, we had 80 uh, attendees tonight. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. Uh, we've got more lectures and webinars to come. And um, we follow up with our newsletter. Do get in, in touch um, if you uh, want any assistance with these types of cases. Of course, at Libertas, we're always keen to help. And I'm always keen to chat about these issues. Abenar is at LSE. Um, I'm sure she'll give you the benefit of her expertise in a, in a case if you need her or both of us will help you find someone to assist um, so that we can help in individual cases, but all also all contribute to greater change. So Abenar, one last thank you to you. Thank you so much for coming and Thank for giving for us the benefit me. of your expertise. And uh, go away and read her article in the Criminal Law <laughs> Review this, this month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Keep safe and well, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>